It's the Task Management and Time Blocking Podcast, Episode 19. Like everyone else who does knowledge work, you receive a lot of emails, more than you'd like. You've harbored dreams of a world in which you could escape this hated chore. But over here in reality, there seems to be no way to alleviate the pain, or is there? Some people suggest that you simply ignore most of your email. Others say that you need to empty your inbox and even keep it that way all the time. In practice, most people spend more mornings, nights, and weekends catching up on email than they care to admit. During the day, they prefer to do what they call real work, not the fake work of reading and replying to email. In this solo episode, I'll be sharing my thoughts about this problem and explore some new thinking that can help us to make some headway. I'm Francis Wade, and welcome to the Task Management and Time Blocking Podcast. And welcome back. If this is your first time listening to the podcast, let me do a little bit of, um, give you a little bit of background to understand exactly why it's designed the way it is. So, <clears throat> We'll spend the first part of our conversation actually getting into the nature of the problem. So we'll be defining the problem. And that will actually take up most of the podcast because once you define a problem in some depth or with some clarity, then often what happens is that some solutions kind of pop out of the diagnosis that you do. So I'm going to quote a a, a very famous person, Albert Einstein, just found this quote. And he said, if I had an hour to solve a problem, I'd spend 55 minutes thinking about the problem and five minutes thinking about solutions. Kind of a good description of the way we do this podcast. At the very end, we'll touch on implementation, but the solutions that I hope to take you through and expose you to will all really be exposed in diagnosis, which is kind of the first part. So let's start with the story. A year ago, Anita accepted an offer of her first promotion. She imagined more time spent with employees, coaching and guiding them to higher performance and personal fulfillment. That's what it would be like. But her reality is all about time spent checking and responding to email. She hated this routine before she got promoted. She should have rejoiced, she thinks, because now it's become a a three-hour-a-day burden. The only tactic that seems to work is to try to do work, is to try to do email on weekends, the only time she can catch up. She and other managers agree. This is the most useless part of their job, the one they could do without. But their complaints don't seem to work. She expects her email to increase, not go away as she shakes her head in bewilderment. Does anyone understand email? Does anyone care? So this hopefully, this sounds a little bit familiar to you. And you may be dealing with somewhere between 50 and 150 email messages per day, which is just about the average. Managers uh, experience more than others. And if you have more direct reports, then you probably get more than someone who only has one direct report. And if you're in a company that has a culture of managing lots of email, maybe there's a lot of remote work, then you would have a a bigger volume of email. And as you can imagine, there's something that happens when that volume increases. Well, let's see. I'm going to assume that you and anybody else who's listening to this podcast, you do expect that As time goes on, your email volume would go up. So for Anita, it's kind of a natural expectation. You know, if she complained to her boss, her boss would say, come and spend a day in my shoes. Because her boss is probably managing even more email. And as we make the transition from analog natives to digital natives, right now the digital natives are age 35 and under. Well, what we could expect is more asynchronous digital communication, not less. 
And as the world gets accustomed to this preferred way of communicating due to its convenience, what you could expect is as you as your business, if your business grows and you deal with more customers, more suppliers, more financiers, more stakeholders, more, that the volume would only go up. So what you really want is probably not to be in denial that this is going to happen because guess what? It is going to happen. You don't really have a choice. What you want is something like peace of mind here, here, and here at all levels of email volume. And when, as it increases, you wanna be able to make some transitions, right? To be able to smoothly improve your performance. It's a little bit like, imagine a, a, an athlete who is, is building up to run a marathon and has never run one before. Well, what you do is you add a little bit more mileage each week and your body gets accustomed to that mileage. And you know, if you're going to be someone who's entering a, a you know, I, I imagine an Olympic marathon or New York marathon, but something that's really competitive, something that maybe could be a part of your living, then you take it very consciously, this transition from lower training volumes and shorter races to much longer races, which is what many long distance runners do they transition to the marathon they don't just get up all of a sudden and say they're going to do one so you want to transition to higher volumes of email and have that transition be be one that's smooth but the other people are of course they don't really care that you're getting lots of email now they care that they you respond to them and that you respond to them um soon <laughs> and they will not think about you and your dwindling needs and your your lack of discretionary time. They're interested in getting a response and they don't get a response. They send another email. Maybe the second email will get your attention because the first one obviously didn't work. So if you may call them the 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 the, the villains of your story in a way but at a higher level it's really about your inability to adjust to higher volumes because you you can't wish them away so they're they're a permanent villain but we can do something about our ability to manage email perhaps problem is that of course as you're trying to adjust as you know anita is trying to make the transition life doesn't stop so the day after her promotion she gets a ton of email everybody thanking her and wishing her all the best that you know she's in a honeymoon period for a day or two and then the real problems start to come all the problems that that the direct reports have been waiting for their manager to tell their manager are now hers and now the email the email email with problems start to arrive as opposed to email of congratulations. I know she has to cope, right? She has to somehow find a way to deal. As she tries to adjust or as you try to adjust, inevitably or it's likely that at some point the volume of email will outstrip your ability to manage it. So what happens in that case? Well, it happens to all of us. We end up backed up, we end up with a backlog, and we fall behind. And with the falling behind comes commitments that we don't meet, expectations that aren't met from other people. The number of unread emails starts to accumulate. We lose sleep because somewhere in that unread email, there could be something important that we're not paying attention to. And we start to uh, uh, feel overwhelmed and anxious because in our mind, you know, there, there could be something lurking and we tell ourselves we should be the kind of person or the kind of professional who stays on top of email. That's why we got promoted. You know, we're a manager because we're better at it, supposedly. We're supposed to be on top of things and it's not cool 
to all of a sudden not be on top of things or to have someone notice or your boss say, hmm, you know, since we've promoted you, I've noticed that you're not on top of things. You know, you don't, you don't want that conversation to happen. And inside, that, that, that brings out feelings of, of failure sometimes or of, you know, you can get upset because you want, you want to demonstrate a certain level of, of capacity or skill. Um, you get frustrated at yourself. You get angry at other people for sending you so much email because you know in the complaints you know over the lunchroom people you know rolling their eyes and saying god you can't imagine how much email i have to do but that would be awesome if it weren't just for the email and they turn email into the villain the email itself and the other people and it's really it is it well it's one that those complaints don't do anything about like i mentioned in the case of anita the complaint doesn't help it may you may feel a little bit more satisfied because you know you're getting it off your chest to some degree, but ultimately you're gonna be back in the lunchroom the next day complaining the same way because the complaints complaining doesn't help. And over time, you know, kind of what happens, you know, some people figure it out, some don't, or some people make a better transition to the one level or the next level, whatever it is, and some don't. And those who don't. Well, you probably know who those people are. They are terrible with email. They don't respond. To get anything done, you've got to walk over to their cubicle or to their office and knock on the door. They are they have a reputation in the office. Someone you know, you ask, Hey, what's up with Fred? I sent him an email last week. And they say, Oh, you don't know about Fred, huh? Yeah, but well, Fred doesn't do email. And you're like, what? Everybody does email. Not Fred. No, whatever the reason is, it doesn't really matter. The fact is, your email to Fred has has apparently disappeared. It has had, hasn't moved the needle one bit. And until you see Fred at lunch and you say, Fred, I sent you an email a week ago. He says, he says, really? <laughs> you say, yeah, you, you know, you know, but he says, he says, listen, don't, don't send me anything by email. I'm terrible at email. Now, he may be great at other parts of his job, but at that part of his job, he is terrible. And you learn, okay, I don't send friend email from now on if I really expect a response. I need to do something else. I need to find him at lunch. And that's the way I'm going to get by, and that's the way I'm going to succeed as, a, as a, a new manager. So Fred's reputation is already in the, you know bad, and you don't want to be like Fred. You don't want yours to be. You don't want to be that person who it's like Fred. Oh, and you or like Anita wouldn't want that. Oh yeah, Fred and Fred and Anita. They're the two ones who you don't send email to them. Good luck. So you don't want to be in that trap. So I, it, it 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 brings on the threat that you could your reputation could take a hit. You know, someone important could send you email. Realize that you're no good at it because you didn't respond and then share that with everybody in the office and say, you know, he's a nice guy. You know, you're a nice guy, but you know, you don't, you're not on top of things. Everyone has the opinion that you are, you know, you're, you're, you're really a Peter principal person. You're promoted way above your ability to manage. And that messes with your reputation and make sure that you don't get another promotion or God forbid you get demoted or you forced to leave. So there should be a way to solve this. So this is, unfortunately, this does not fall into one of those problems that you might say has been around forever. Because this has not been around forever. This is a new problem. And the level at which you need to manage it and think about it has shifted over time. Because the problem that existed back in 1996 when email first came out is not a problem that we have today in 2022. But what's happened in between to help us solve the problem is almost nothing. So, ideally, there should be, there needs to be, we should expect that there is something that, there is a way to approach this that does move the needle and doesn't solve one problem like, okay, now, I'm caught, now I've caught up. And it doesn't allow you to hit one level 
and then stay there. It allows you to keep scaling. So there should be a permanent way to understand what you need to do to keep growing your capacity so that you can always manage future email volume. All right, that's kind of the world that, that if there's an epic kind of struggle here, it's the struggle to keep up with this new form of communication that we really don't seem to understand all that well. Studies just are missing and that's part, part of the reason why we're having this podcast and it's a level at which it is, which is still exploratory is because it's just not the research. It just doesn't exist, doesn't tell, doesn't, hasn't been done by any anyone in academia or any of the books that I'm aware of that really get to the heart of what we're going to be talking about today. So the result is, you know, because we don't really know what we're solving here and it's a new problem, it means that improvements are haphazard and we don't have much faith in, you know, those five tips to manage your email posts that we see on, on blogs or on, on Medium or on LinkedIn. We don't have much faith in those. Anything that says five tips to solve email, your email problems is probably going to be at a real beginner level. It's not going to be substantial. It's not going to solve the big problem that I described at the beginning. But, you know, we'll read those articles because if we're really desperate, it's better than nothing else, right? You, you try something. Try something that, and that's kind of the state of the art right now, is try anything. And it doesn't work. There's not a systematic way that we've developed to tackle that problem. Or a systematic way. We have, we have tips for how to get out of a, of a hole that you're in right now. But nothing that talks about the overall picture and what you need to do to solve it. So this random approach doesn't work. As I said, it's exacerbated by the fact of no, no, no research. The apps that exist are, they promise all kinds of things, email apps, um, and they don't, they don't deliver, to say the least. And their books and their, their tapes, podcasts, people who give advice about different kinds of behaviors to implement, and those seem to be more um, fruitful. People who describe a particular system that you need to follow, a prescription. But if you examine and sort of look at the real details of what they're saying, they don't get close to what I'm talking about. The management of a increasing volume over time. So an article may deal with some aspect of what we're talking about, but it won't deal with them all at once. And I'm going to argue that this is kind of a complex problem for a, a number of reasons. And to be effective and to do, and once again, to do that scaling that I talked about, that that steady improvement, um, regardless of volume, you need to manage or you need to tackle a bunch of issues all at the same time. You need to be effective at all of them. This is a multi-pronged approach. So some, of course, you know, just say, you know, get rid of email and like, Fred or they get to the end of the year, they just hit delete and they delete all their email for the year. <laughs> and they say, I'm going to start all over again. If you really need me, come and talk to me. <laughs> you know, they, they're, they're, they're like terrorists with respect to email communication. They just tear it all up and expect everyone else to adjust, which they don't. So backing off of commitment, I'm going to suggest that that's not an option. That's not a, that's not a solution. That's a cop out. And maybe you might get away with it one year or next year or the next year, but there's gonna come a time when you know you're gonna delete the wrong email and you're gonna fail as a result of it. So that threat doesn't go away and the chances of it being a fact of your future, the chances of it occurring is gonna increase as your volume increases. So you're looking at a greater risk and a greater threat, not less. I don't really have a lot of good news here, do I? <laughs> no, but it's a reason for us to, to get ourselves into gear and to think about this with some clarity. So maybe today I can give you some 
insight, some progress into how to think about managing your email so that you can put your mind at ease somewhat with respect to what's coming again, a, a further increase in the time, uh, the, the way in which you're going to be managing email in the future. So one of the, one of the ideas I want to share, um, actually, before I actually get to that, which is more about the solutions, let me, if I had you in front of me, this is the point at which I would ask you, do, does this resonate with you at all? Do you notice that as the, have you noticed that as the volume of email increases and you hear from more people that this ability that you need to develop has become more acute? And if you don't develop it, the chances of things going awry uh, is increasing. The risk is going up. And that you're someone who is just not willing. If you listen this far, and you've not, you know, turned over to Facebook and gone to Instagram or, you know, you've not just given up. Chances are you do want to make a dent in this problem. And you want to make some interventions into your regular routines. You want to be someone who has some skill and someone who has some knowledge and you want to have that make a difference. And um, I, I can say that I went from being someone and I, I didn't know what I was doing, but now I could see that I made a, a journey from someone who treated email as if it was something I could just do between important tasks to being someone who now sees the management of email as a huge part of my job. Huge, not in terms of just the time, not the three hours that Anita was talking about, but a central and important point of my day. As in, it's a, it's a, difficult and intense activity that orients everything I'm about as a professional. So I'm suggesting that email management is one of the most important activities that you could engage in. And in fact, on average, it's the most important thing that you'll do every day. Now, this is a totally, you know, wild point of view because most people and maybe you're one of them, you know, you, maybe you'll see that your point of view is that email is just a nuisance. Email is like a mosquito. It's to be squashed somehow, gotten rid of, repelled. And you hope for the day when all email systems crash and you'll be free. And as you know, I'm saying that's not coming. I'm saying maybe the way to view email is not as a nuisance. It's just the old kind of the old schema. And in that old schema, there were techniques you could use to reduce the nuisance. It's instead to see it as the most important activity that you engage in on most days, not every day, but on an average day, the most important, the key period of the day is the time that you spend doing email. Why would I say all of that? Well, consider this point of view. If you know anything about Kaizen, uh, the, the idea of continuous improvement, you'd know that defects are really useful. So defects are useful because they point to areas where you're not hitting a particular standard. So a defect could be, for example, uh, an injury that you have when you're, say, training for, back to the athletics analogy, training for a sport. So a defect would be, for example, getting injured in training or overtraining. Um, something happens that went wrong. The standard is that you do your training in order to perform at, you know, in the competition or in the race or in the game, the big game. The idea of training is not to get injured because that thwarts everything. So if you get hurt while you're training, that's it's a defect. No, the defect causes you to step back and have to deal with it. But but it's also a great teaching moment. You know, life is now teaching you that there's only so much you can do. 
And if you don't pay attention, then you will bring about these defects. And the thing about them is that they allow you to focus your attention. They, 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 they allow you to bring questions of, okay, how do I solve this defect so it doesn't happen again? And what is it teaching me about my system and its limits? Defects are our friends. In the Kaizen or Japanese way of continuous improvement. So I want you to consider that email is a defect. Email is a defect. That someone sends email when there's some communication that needs to take place. And the only way to make it happen, or the best way to make it happen, is via email. And that in a perfect world with perfect communication between us, telepathy or something, we wouldn't need email. We wouldn't need this form of digital communication. But we use it because it's the next best thing. We need to make requests of each other we need to put demands request uh, make demands on each other not really make demands but we need to make requests of each other uh, trigger obligations trigger demand trigger time demands and um, which I'll explain in just a minute but the email email is a great way to do it it's far better than using other kinds of objects that have been used in the past so before the invention of paper, probably all there was was verbal communication. That was it. And memory. And when we had a, a, a meeting or if I wanted to communicate something, all I could do was tell you about it and you'd have to remember. You couldn't write it down. Paper was created. Paper, of course, is a physical object. And that physical object could capture what are called time demands. So I want to introduce a lot of new jargon in this um, podcast but a time demand is an individual and internal commitment to complete a task in the future so it's a promise that you make yourself it's individual means like it's personal it only belongs to you and it's a commitment to complete a task in the future okay so a time demand will be captured on paper and that worked because paper is pretty effective. Right? But in the mid-90s, paper was replaced by digital communication for the most part. The, 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 the replacement started and it continues to this day. But everyone, the world agreed that digital objects for managing time demands is far superior than physical objects. And so the whole world has made a shift. The problem is that you couldn't send 500, 10,000 letters, a million. You couldn't, you couldn't send an unlimited number of messages uh, using physical objects. But with digital objects, you sure can. <laughs> with a click of a button, five minutes later, everyone on your mailing list now has you asking them to do something. And that could never happen at scale before, before the creation of digital objects. Now, what email has introduced, <coughs> has preserved, is the fact that you could send an asynchronous communication. So before you, you know, if you had, if you were on television, you could speak to an audience and then you could trigger a time demand. Everyone tune in next week when we're, when we're back here at, which would, everybody go, oh, I want to see what happens in the next episode. So they'd make a, a mental commitment Ooh, because you communicated it to them electronically at scale, but it was all synchronous, right? Great thing about email is that it's introduced asynchronous communication. So like a letter, you could send someone a letter now, it gets there in two weeks time and it triggers the time demand when the letter arrives and they read it, something happens, right? They make the commitment. Same thing happens with email. Great thing about email, digital communication is that it's asynchronous. It can get stored. You can send it. <clears throat> now it arrives later. 
it goes through the same process. It triggers a time demand, but you don't have to be talking to the person to make make the 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 or initiate the trigger or make the request. So this is really cool, and this is why you could send so much of so many uh, email messages because digital objects are far better than physical objects. So what happens when you send an email to someone? Well, let's dig a little deeper. So an email arrives in your inbox and it's a, again, it's a form of digital communication. It's sitting there. It's just a bunch of bits and bytes, right? Sitting in somewhere in cyberspace. And until you access that email, and read it. Nothing much is going on except bits are occupying space on some storage device. But once you read the email, something psychological happens. Okay? So the creation of a time demand as you're reading that email is a psychological activity, right? It's something that happens in your mind. And until you read that email, nothing psychological is happening, right? With respect to a time demand. So it's sitting there in your inbox, this email. And until you interact with it, it's a potential time demand. Until you read it and activate it, so to speak, it could then become an actual time demand. So email inboxes contain potential time demands until you've interacted with it and you turn some of them into actual time demands. Two different kinds of psychological objects, right? Both triggered by the same email, the same message, the same digital object. So potential becomes actual. Sometimes, sometimes you just simply delete the email and it disappears. It doesn't turn into anything. It potential turns into nothing. And probably most of the email that you receive, I get about 250 emails a day. I think about 10 of them are converted into actual time demands. So this process is one that you can't escape. This is just kind of how it works. The, and this is why the volume of email doesn't matter as much as we think it should. Because if you can filter potential time demands that will never become actual time demands away from you, then you're good. If you can somehow focus your attention on the few potential time demands that turn into actual time demands and do that with some skill, then you're even better. Because now you could be getting a thousand emails. But if a thousand emails only yield 10 potential time demands, then we're talking about something, a different kind of problem. We're now talking about a filtering problem as opposed to a decision making problem. Now, I'm using all this fancy language, but I, I, I don't want to underestimate the problem. The filtering that we most of us do each day doesn't take place by a machine, it takes place by us personally. And this activity of filtering email, turning it into potential time demands, sorry, into actual time demands from potential time demands, and then managing the time demands and putting them in a secure place, is what I refer to as the most important part of your day on most days. Why? Because most people are interacting with you via email. You, know, you don't go to a meeting every day necessarily. And you don't go to a meeting every day that generates any time demands for you. You could be in a meeting all, you know, three straight days and you don't walk away with a single time demand for you. But your email is a concentrated place for, we usually think of it as the management of messages. Uh, in this podcast, I'm casting a whole different view of it, a whole different lens, which is that it's for the management of actual time demands. 
it's for the filtering of potential time demands away from you and the attraction and conversion of potential time demands to actual time demands for the ones which you care about. Okay, so this most important part of your day is requires your best attention because as you go through email messages, you probably notice that it's hard. So what, what, what makes it hard? Well, the volume doesn't help, but each, every time you go through your email inbox, whether it's low volume or high volume, you need to switch context between messages because the people who send you emails aren't sending them in a way that's coordinated. They're not sending them in a way that's flagged that says, oh, this is spam, don't worry about it. They're, they're not sending you, they're, they're, they're all trying to get your attention. They, they all want you to convert a potential time demand to an actual time demand, which takes a lot of energy on your part, focus, and you've got to make a lot of decisions. So if you've ever heard this statistic that said, some survey said that a third of people would rather clean a toilet than go through all their email. Well, the reason that that's, well, people responded that way on the survey is because of the number of decisions that have to be made in the email that you have not processed. So in that email that you haven't processed, there's a whole bunch of decisions you need to make. And as you make those decisions, you're flipping from one context to the next, one part of your life to the other. Emails from your boss are interspersed with emails from your kids. Emails on the project are interspersed with with communication from HR that about your benefit plan. Spam is interspersed with e email communication from your CEO who needs something urgently. So it's like a box of chocolates. You don't know what you're going to get at the first school. But it's not a tasty block box of chocolates. It's a pain. And this is why you want to give it your best time. Give it your absolute best energy a clear mind because regardless of the volume you must engage in this activity as long as the world is sending email so we're talking about an activity that is not escapable and it will always be require high energy because you're switching between contexts if you're switching at high volumes it makes it even worse so how could you think about gaining some skill at managing and doing this activity at a higher level? Well, so let's talk about one, one that I mentioned before very briefly, which is to shutter away, or shutter, no, to shuffle away or to stream away or filter all of the email that is unlikely to turn into an actual time demand. So first thing is your spam filters need to be strong. And spam management is not an option in this world that we live in. You may probably respond, uh, uh, subscribe to newsletters. And some of those newsletters generate more actual time demands than others. So I use a program called Unroll that allows me to manage time demands. It filters away the ones that belong to a newsletter. It does a really good job. I train, it basically it's something that I've, it's a program I've trained so that all the emails that are unlikely to turn into actual time demands get filtered over somewhere else and managed in a different place. So there's a number of programs that allow you to do this. I'll put the link in the show notes, but this is a good one. And it's the future because if you're going to be managing large numbers, you need a strong filter up front. So there's your spam filter, yeah, but there's also your newsletter filter where the ones that are unlikely to yield an actual time demand or that with less probability are shuttled and placed somewhere else. Now, I'm not necessarily saying that you delete all of them which is what some people recommend. Now, you don't read any newsletters. What I'm suggesting is that you 
find a way to manage them off track. And it's a probability game. Because you don't want to cut yourself off from sources of information or of knowledge. You don't, you don't want to be someone who is separated from the world. Don't pay attention to certain news items. You've got to watch what's happening in your industry. There's a bunch of things. Potential time demands that could become actual. But it's a probability game, right? You want the lowest probability ones to be filtered away. And when they're filtered away, they're placed in a repository, some kind of library, some kind of database somewhere where you can go and read and process that email at your leisure. So you would time block a different time on your calendar that says go through newsletter. And that's when you go through all these newsletters. At the same time, the ones that escape that filter have a much higher probability of generating actual time demands. And those are the ones that hopefully you're sitting down to look at. So if I were to tell you that the problem of managing 100 emails is the same as the problem of managing 5,000 emails a day, you probably tell me I'm crazy. But what we're looking for here are principles. Principle is that we're looking for the, the, the messages with the highest probability of turning into actual time demands to make it past our filters. So we're talking here about uh, partly a filtering problem. Not only a filtering problem, but that's a huge part of it. Part of it also is what I mentioned before, which is that you are giving the best time of the day, the premium attention to managing these potential to actual time demands, the ones with high probability. It's another part of it. Another piece of the whole puzzle is measurement. So I've not found an email program, and I'm sure one exists somewhere, but I've not found an email program that measures email. So this is other than saying, here's what's in the number that are in your inbox. So there is no way to scale past a particular level, a point, without confronting the analytics of your email, such as how many messages come in per day. If you could measure how many were filtered away to the potential time demands with low probability, how many were filtered in the right way, how many filtered were filtered in the wrong way, if it could measure all of that and tell you how well your filtering is working, you'd be really happy, right? If it were 90% effective, you'd be like, yeah, that's great. How much time you're spending um, in the whole process, managing it in those peak times of day. How long it's taking for you to reply to emails. Is it ideal for the kind of work that you're doing? The number of emails that you send out each day, time it takes you to compose. So there's some this is the real problem, right? So, okay, there's got to be analytics to help you to scale. So I've, I use a couple of programs right now. I'll put, the, put them in the, I mentioned them in the show notes that I use to manage my analytics around my email usage. No, they're not terribly useful yet. But the time will come when a really good program will integrate itself into Gmail and will allow you to manage your email with more skill. But it's better than nothing right now. And right now, we're, it, this is such a sort of a, great, a green area worthy of exploration that we're not even sure exactly what to measure. So I've mentioned a few things here. A, a couple of ideas I actually I just am mentioning to you for the first time because as I'm explaining the issue, they're coming to me. Some of the things that I want to have measured, like the number that get filtered correctly versus the ones that don't get filtered correctly. That never thought of that before. But we need metrics. So we need analytics. So if you're serious about scaling, you've got to be like me. Looking out for analytics, looking out for email programs that give you more than just kind of dumb metrics about the number that are in an inbox. We want in-process metrics. How well am I doing 
at this task and where are my opportunities for improvement? And given that I'm going to be looking at managing 25% more email in a year's time, how am I scaling my skills? Am I, how, am I preparing myself? Do the numbers show that my capacity is growing? So these are commonplace concepts that I'm talking about in other areas, other disciplines. It's just that we need to apply them to email. This, this is not a temporary issue. This is not a sometime problem. Part of the reason I, I can argue this with some conviction is that the people in your life who want to get your attention, that number is going to increase. They're going to use more email than ever before. Or it doesn't matter whether it's email, WhatsApp, Apple Messages. It doesn't, the, the, the form of the messaging doesn't really matter. We're just talking about all digital asynchronous communication, all digital objects that are sent to you in order as potential time demands so that you could convert them to actual time demands, regardless of where they come from in your universe, as long as they're coming from some source. And that source is sending them to you in a some kind of stream that's, a, that's not a smooth stream, it's a kind of a random stream of whatever based on whatever they think is important. But this is not going away. It may not be Gmail, it may be some other form of mail tomorrow, but it doesn't matter. They're all equivalent for the purposes of what I'm talking about. For the psychology, the underlying problem doesn't go away because you're now using Outlook versus Gmail. No, we wish. So that doesn't go away. You've got to get better. And the people who use are on the other end. They're not going away. So the fact that they're not going away, well, what does that mean? So you can hope for a day when they get trained to not send you messages that are unlikely to turn into actual time demands. You could hope for a day when they respect your inbox or send you clear emails for that matter, you know, where there is a time demand in there, a potential time demand at a real high level of actual, you ask them a question, they're responding, and as you read their response, you're like, I have no idea what this means. And half an hour later, you still don't know what they're talking about. So then you've got to respond um, politely. I didn't understand. Could you clear up what that? That's why email is the most important thing that you'll do for most most days on the average day. That's actually something I've, I've not quite thought of and said before in a way. I just said it. <laughs> but on the average day, yeah, this is the most, active, most important activity that you'll do. So we want to bring a level of kind of a respect to it because we can't escape it, right? So they're not getting better at sending email. And the fact that they're not getting better anytime soon means that you've got to be more prepared. If you want to stay out of overwhelm, and you don't want to get buried. So the, the onus is back on you. So you've got to be extraordinarily prepared for the time when you know they're not going to understand the potential versus actual time demands they're not going to understand time demands they're not going to understand triggers their their the the technology will be, will be slow to come to them the measurements won't be there it, this the, that these things are not happening anytime soon i could share with you i'm going to share with you an idea that i've had so in addition to training people in your company and training your customers, suppliers, training everybody in your universe. Nirvana, right? What, what I'd love to see happen is that in companies for internal email, that email has a budget. So if email had a budget, each person could only send a certain number of emails for free. And after that, they'd have to pay. So probably wouldn't be deducted from their paycheck. But as you can imagine, there you could put in place some gamification that says each person has 100 units of email per month. Use it wisely. If you don't and you have to request more units, you'll be having a conversation with your boss. Now all of a sudden, 
it's kind of like, whoa, before I send that email to everybody in the company, telling them about nothing or taking up their bandwidth, maybe I would think about it before hitting send and saying, hmm, how many units is this going to take up? Back to the idea of email being a defect. Now you're looking at ways of actually reducing email, which, guess what? That should be an objective of every company. Why? Because email is very costly. The activity of scanning your email, scanning potential time demands to convert them to actual time demands is expensive. And a convoluted email sent to 30 people the cost is ridiculous and there's no repercussions maybe your performance management you might sit down the person's boss might sit down with them and say hey you know notice that you've been sending lots of email and and then you say i don't think it's that many and you say well for example the one you sent last week that one was really important yeah but over the month you know i get the impression you've been sending too many to too many people how many? So with no metrics, there's no real conversation to have. There's no feedback. So if you start with the idea that email is a defect and defects are to be eliminated and that a company needs to get by on the minimum number of emails that it send, that are sent and that there needs to be measurements to encourage people to get better at email so they send fewer messages then a CEO can say, wow, could we get to the end of the year, send 25% less, fewer emails, and still achieve our goals? Consider it to be a, a quality measure. Poor quality environment, lots of emails, lots of defects. Higher quality environment, only the absolute minimum number of emails are sent. Now, if you don't buy my argument that email is expensive, again, let's go to that email that was sent to the 40 people each of them has to spend a whole bunch of time processing it. So that's 40 times whatever amount of time it's, it takes. And the overall overwhelm it adds to because here's another email. Could be something important so people can't ignore it. I'll give you a, an example, uh, an actual. Uh, there was a, a company I worked with and a, a vice president mentioned to one of his direct reports, I think you're taking too long to respond to my email so for my email i want you to read and respond within an hour so the person said aye aye sir and they dutifully let their colleagues know that listen the vice president said that anybody sending him email needs to respond within the hour and if you have been in a situation like this where everyone is stuck in their inbox scanning it just in case the vice president sends a actual time demand or something that results in an actual time demand and therefore spends the better part of their day suffering because they need to check email over and over and checking and checking and checking and therefore getting no work done you know what i'm talking about the article i wrote i'll, I'll drop it in the show notes again is why how executives unwittingly turn employees in to morons and it's it, it, it has it, it has everything to do with making requests like that that highlights the cost of email because that vice president's request turns everyone into the company into email checking machines so they have to check email every hour just in case the vice president sent them an email which means they need to check all of their messages Okay, so email is very expensive. Email is costly. Email is a defect. And companies need first a commitment to understand what email is all about. So some of the things I've talked about need to be understood. They need measurement so that at least we have an idea of the impact and the ways that it could be improved. And then we need some games. So by some games, I mean, for example, you get to the end of the year, 25% less email, same revenue. And the following year, 25% less email and same revenue. 
they need to set these kinds of targets. And again, my argument is that number four, maybe the reasons that they need to do this is because email is so expensive. Email is so costly. And the cost is not being it's not being confronted by any particular executive. Unfortunately, in most I've not seen a company where it's properly being tackled. And I think the reason is because it's nobody's job. Now, ultimately, it's a CEO's job, but whose job is it that we improve our productivity in the way that we use email? IT? Operations? HR? Learning and development? It's nobody's job. So it afflicts every single knowledge worker in the company and it destroys productivity and it gets worse and everyone gathers around the lunch table and complains about how much email they have and there's no one working on even the beginning of a solution. So this is a lot. <laughs> and you might want well to be some uh, our episode that you go back to and listen to maybe a few times because I've touched on a lot of different things. But they all need to be thought of together because email presents a challenge that the workplace has never seen before. We really don't know what to do with this. We don't know how to think about it. We don't have the models that, that we need to make either corporate progress or just progress for me as an individual. It's kind of a mystery. And I don't know other than to do what Anita said, which is not sustainable. Spend my weekends and my nights and my mornings and my vacation and my sick days and my lunchtime catching up on email. Because I'm still in the old model of 1995 where email was this rare thing that came in once a day. And when it came in, it was like, oh, I got an email. And you got one email per day. And the habits that we developed for the one email per day haven't scaled. And that's what's causing the problem that we have. So I hope in all of this, there are some solutions that you could pursue and a trajectory, a journey that you could put yourself on where this, this, is, a, this is a little bit like taking care of your health. In the, in the domain of wellness, there's taking care of your, <clears throat> your physical health. Let's say your, your, your aerobic capacity, your aerobic abilities. So from now until the day you die, you should be concerned about your aerobic capacity, right? You should be, con con be concerned about what happens when you need to, your heart rate goes up, your lungs need to, your body needs to, your muscles need to. That's something you need to care about from now until the day you die. Guess what? You're probably going to be managing email right up until the very end. And you need to care about this problem the way you care about these other kind of lifelong problems. Because it's only going in one direction. You know, for most of us, our health is not going to improve dramatically. Once you get a little bit older, you get a couple of grays here, gray hairs. Your health is not going to, oh, make a sudden improvement. Email is not going to, oh, the volume is going to drop. There's always going to be digital asynchronous communication. And you'll always be needing to manage the volume effectively. Just because we haven't seen it happen before doesn't mean it's not coming to a retirement home near you or to a retirement uh, dream that you want to live or that I want to live. So thanks for, for joining me on this podcast. It's not finished. I want to tell you a little bit about the next episode after a couple of moments. Stay tuned. Keep listening. And here's a clip from our next episode with Dr. Frank Buck. So what I finally was smart enough to figure out after several decades was during the process of changing my system, I was cleaning it up. And so I was starting with something that was clean. No wonder it worked. So now every time I get the idea that, oh, I need a new system, the smart part of my brain tells the dumb part, no, you don't need a new system. You need to clean up the one you have. Yeah. And if you want to leave a comment about this episode or any aspect of the work that we're doing here at the Task Management and Time Blocking Podcast, you can go over to www.replytofrancis.info and send me either a message, 
uh, by text or send me a voice message, a voice note. And as you probably know, we have a couple of places that you can interact with other people, talk about this episode. One is at the community, mightytaskers.scheduleu.org, and you'll see the link in the show notes. And the other, of course, is our upcoming Task Management and Time Blocking Summit coming up in March. Two outstanding opportunities to interact with other people about the ideas that you've heard on this podcast or any of our episodes that are coming up. And if you'd like to support the work we're doing, I invite you to click on the Patreon link below to make a donation. And please don't forget to like our show and recommend it to others on iTunes, Stitcher, Google, or whatever past podcast app or service you're using. This is Francis Wade. I'm signing out. I hope to see you on a future episode. And until then, take care and all the best. See you later.